Okay, that looks about right. If not, I can fix it later. Hey. All right, so it looks like we've got ourselves a little series going here. Um, just when I think I'm done, it pulls me back. Uh, I think that I want to talk just a little bit more today about uh, obedience um, from this angle. We've covered it in the last couple videos. If you watched it, that's cool. If not, that's cool too. You know, do what you want. It's all good. Uh, obedience, the idea of serving God one moment at a time, one breath at a time, one step at a time. Uh, I want to talk about whether it's really necessary or not. That may seem an obvious answer, or maybe not. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how it strikes you, the concept of, of learning to live your life one moment at a time with the Lord and doing what He says at all times instead of what we want. Uh, not my will, but yours be done. Is this just one of those things that sounds good to religious people who are aiming to be super Christians, or is this something that God really requires of everybody? I'm going to say that the answer is both. I think that for God structuring his kingdom such that uh, a kingdom needs lots of things. Obviously a king and a realm and a capital city and, uh, and lots and lots of people, lots of people in positions of authority and leadership, teachers, farmers, uh, explorers, I don't know, you name it. Uh, it isn't just a case of Jesus is the king and then he's got endless people that he just saved and then there's even more people that got lost for some reason because they didn't believe the right things in, at the right time. Uh, and then for sorry, my hands are tied apparently and you off, off you go into the into the lake of fire. He's structuring his kingdom and he, he needs in certain key positions people that he can trust that he knows will obey him. And they're not going to run off and do their own thing and create another rebellion like Lucifer did. And so he needs people that are willing to give themselves over that completely to him to be recreated in his image so that the Father and the Son can come and dwell and live in them and together they can rule uh, the works of, of God's hands, all of them. Um, I think that's the plan. But I think that God sifts out of mankind and sifts and sifts out of the church and sifts and sifts, sifts out until he gets one here and one there who are actually willing to do that. And I guess my question to you uh, would be, <clears throat> is that something really that you want to do? Or is it even necessary at all? Uh, I think if you're if you react strongly against that idea of giving yourself over to Jesus that completely so that his will can be done and that the kingdom can come, <laughs> thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, if that f scares the life out of you, don't worry. It scared the life out of me for a long time uh, because we're made in his image, as I said. We have a strong will and we want to do, it's just in our nature to want to do what we want to do. That's part of being in his image. He has a will. He made us in his image. We have a will. Um, he wants to be, he wants to create, he wants to destroy, he wants to judge, to judge, to play, uh, to uh, rejoice, to uh, all these aspects of God's personality. He put versions of them in us as well. That's part of his image. We're just not in union with him yet, which is why we create little problems everywhere we go because we take all of the things that are in us that he put in us that are positives and we put them under our control and then we run off and we cause more problems than we, than we that's sin, that's disobedience. So is, does this idea of living that kind of life scare you to your core? I hope so, because the, that's just your, uh, that's counting the cost. Uh, where does it say, which, I don't know, Luke, where if you're going to build, a, uh, you're gonna build a, a tower, it makes sense to sit down and, and count the cost before you start to make sure you've got what it takes to finish the job, because otherwise you just start it, and then you realize partway through that you don't, you don't, I don't have what it takes, and then that's a problem. So I'm not... Um, saying every Christian should start here. Uh, I'm saying that uh, if this is your calling, then it will it will touch something inside of you that will just make you sing, and it will uh, it will resonate so strongly with you that the idea of that serving God and that His will would be done uh, will cuts through all of the fleshy nonsense in you, and it makes something ring. Uh, otherwise, if uh, if it doesn't, and, and you and you repel you 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 pull back away from it, then um, you're making God's job a little easier. That's what he's doing. He's trying to decide where you fit, where I fit. He's trying to find those few that he can use uh, to become sons of his so that his kingdom can come and we can move out of this cursed uh, in, environment and part of existence and into the next when, with the new heaven and the new earth and we get our bodies back and uh, his kingdom can begin. Uh, and then the structure will be in place to prevent rebellion from ever happening again. Uh, so... Is it necessary 
to live a breath at a time, a moment at a time, uh, trying to find what he wants, setting aside your will uh, so that his will, so that he can live through you. You have to decide that between you and the Lord. You can't put anyone in between. You can't say, uh, Lord, I'd like to serve you, but the idea of losing things or people or my situation or your any aspect of your life, uh, the idea of losing any of that or those people or my kids or my spouse just is too much for me. I couldn't, because the idea is if you're going to do what he says, he's a whole person who's got a life and a will and, and he's, he's unpredictable. He could tell you there's no, he's got the greatest imagination and you can imagine, and there's no limit to what he could tell you. So if you commit to that kind of relationship, you can't say, I'll only serve you if I like what I'm hearing, if I like the command that you give me. I still want to reserve the right to deny. And then, then you've got problems, because if you sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment, where God will destroy the adversaries. You set yourself up as an adversary. If you ask him what his will is, he tells you, you consider it, and you reject it. That is a whole nother ball game. That's why I'm asking you to count the cost, because this kind of lifestyle where you commit yourself a breath at a time, a moment at a time, to following the king and to obeying him. Uh, once you commit to that, you've got to do that. You, it's climbing a ladder. You get bumped off. The higher you go, the longer you go in that relationship. If you get knocked off, that's a long fall down. And there's no saying you'll ever come back from that. That's uh, Hebrews 6, which gets uh, explained away by every preacher I've ever heard, other than Dr. Thompson, uh, why Hebrews 6 doesn't mean Christians who have tasted the, the power of the age to come and all that. If they fall away, you can't renew them to repentance. I want you guys to count the cost on this. Uh, like I am, and obviously don't do it for me. Do it's just between you and the Lord. Uh, you have to ask yourself: Is it really necessary, or is it okay for me just to believe and to have my confidence that when I die, I'll go to heaven and live in paradise forever? If that's all you're in it for, then you just need to decide that. And that helps God with His sifting process. He will sift you out and put you where you belong. Uh, but if you want to give yourself to that kind of commitment, not only will you bring the kingdom of God that much closer, but the rewards, read all the rewards in over, um, to the overcomers in Revelation. That's just for starters. What It will cost you everything to live that kind of life, but what you will gain is not even comprehensible to you right now. And it's not going to be given to everybody who names the name of Christ, to those who overcome. Read what he said to the church in Sardis. You have a few names in Sardis who will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. That's not talking about a few names from the city of Sardis who are in the church and all, everyone who's in the church. That's talking about to the church of Sardis. That's his body. It's his lampstand. There's a couple names in there who's going to walk with me in white, for they're worthy. The rest of them will go where they belong. That's cool. There is roam the fields of God and, and uh, enjoy his blessing. But what could have been possible for them, they, can't, they will not even begin to understand what they passed up, the opportunity to lay hold of. It's remarkable. So the, the three things I wanted to talk about, I'm just going to hit this first one today, is you have to ask yourself, is it really necessary? If you feel it's necessary, then you need to count the cost, no matter how many years it takes, before you commit to that life. Because once you commit to that, it's going to drag you through the knothole, and you have to endure. He that endures to the end will be saved. Um, after you decide to commit to that, you have to decide if you really want to hear his voice at any given time and find out what he wants. And then the biggie, the third one is, once he tells you what to do, are you going to do it? Or are you going to balk? Are you going to recoil? Uh, will you really do whatever God tells you to do? You can't retain your own your right to veto and think you're going to get anywhere with him. And don't think he's not going to test you. And don't think those tests aren't going to come from directions you have no idea are coming. He's going to sweep your legs because he's got to. Because in the untold years to come, eons to come, when you're, you're dancing with him in his kingdom and you're ruling, if there's anything that can come and trip you up at any given time and cause a big problem, he needs to address that now. So your life, that's what this life is for you if you commit to that life. That your life is going to be one daily challenge after another while God pokes and prods and tests and sees how you're going to respond and to see if you can get back up again if you can, and you can press on with him and learn your lessons and then go through that process of becoming the king and the priest that he wants you to be. You don't get all that just by becoming a Christian. You don't get all that just by coming to church. Um, I wanted to read one verse before I end here. Uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. I know you've heard this before, but listen again. Listen again. 
and tell me, in light of what we've been talking about these last couple of videos, think about this. Paul is telling the church in Philippi this, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I'm going to stop there for a second. Let this, he's telling them this is what Jesus' attitude was. Let it be in you, believers, also. Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. I looked it up in a different translation. It means this. Uh, Amplified says, don't, he didn't regard his equality with God as a thing to be grasped or asserted or to be used to his own advantage. He was equal with God, but he set that aside, is what it says. Remember, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. He was in the form of, he was equal with God, but he set that aside. He made himself of no reputation. He stripped himself of anything he felt he had the right to use legally for his advantage. He, did, he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant. He did that voluntarily, taking, taking the form of a bond servant and coming to us in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man like us. He humbled himself and became obedient unto the point of death, even the death on the cross. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. He did not consider his right to whoever he thought he was. He set it all aside, and he humbled himself, took on the form of a bondservant, came to us to live as a man like us, and was became obedient unto the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore God, because he did this, God also highly exalted him, and gave him a name which is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. You know the rest of it. Um, let this mind be in you, Paul says, to believers like us, that was also in Christ. Made himself of no reputation, became a bondservant, became obedient unto the point of death. Now I ask you again, is learning obedience important or not? Is it part of the salvation or not? Or is it just raise your hand, accept these facts, and get your ticket to heaven? I think you need to decide. And don't sweat it. Be honest with God. Talk to him about it. Let him deal with you. Don't commit right away. Don't do anything impulsive. Count the cost and decide if this is something that you want to pursue or not. I've got other verses here, which we may hit another time. I think I'm coming up on 10 minutes here. Uh, but from the beginning, uh, obedience, God expected his people to obey his commandments. That was under the Old Testament, and it's under the New Testament. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I tell you? Does that one just like skip past people? I must have read that a hundred times and never realized what it was saying. You call me Lord and you don't do what I tell you. Why? He's saying. Why? What did he say to the rich young ruler? You call me good. There's only one good person. That's the father. Wait, that's a whole other discussion. But then he says, if you would see life, keep the commandments. Now, did he mean that? Or was he playing passive-aggressive games with the crowd or with this rich young ruler? Was he being sneaky? Or did he really mean, if you would see life, if you would enter into life, keep the commandments? Which ones, Lord? Don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. He, he ran down the Ten Commandments, and the guy said, I've kept them all from my youth. This thing you lack. Sell everything that you have and follow me. And the guy went away bummed because he had a lot of stuff. His stuff was his God. Hmm. Yeah. Romans 6.16, Do you not know that who you present yourselves as a slave to obey, you are that person's slave that you obey? Whether you obey sin, leading sin, rebellion, disobedience, leading unto death, or of a slave of obedience leading to righteousness. I think righteousness and obedience has gotten a bad rap. Um, I'm doing my little part to try to reestablish it as far as a part of the conversation. Uh, I just want you to think about that. Is obedience necessary? Give it a lot of thought. Don't be impulsive, uh, but uh, try to pray about it and see what God says. Is that uh, a, a direction you need to step in? I think you do. And if you do, you'll, uh, the creation will rejoice. They're waiting for the revelation of the sons of God, and you can be one of them. All right, I think I'm going to pull the plug here. And, uh, yeah, boy, 14 minutes. Sorry about that.